Well, hey, everybody, the secret to successfully leading in chaotic times, that's what we're going to explore today. Uh, you know, in times of, a, of extreme uncertainty, which I think most of us have felt, we've all understood it over these past two years, both social and economic, many individuals and companies, uh, they freeze and they fail. So what is the secret to successfully leading in these chaotic times? So we're going to unpack that today with our special guest, with change management and VUCA expert, Walter uh, Glazier out of yeah, Germany, well, based out of Germany. So excited to have you. So we're going to dig deep in this. So welcome to It's VUCA, The Secret to Living in the 21st Century. This is the channel where we interview some of America's top futurists, leadership and management gurus, mental and health global. experts. And so, global. Global. Absolutely. I said world's top. Chris, yeah. who I'll get to. Uh, in just a moment, Chris just can't be quiet anytime. So you'll understand that, Walter. But uh, anyway, I'm your host, Mike Schindler, and with me <laughs> is our co-host, three-time <laughs> Emmy Award-winning producer and writer, Chris Nolan. So, yeah, <laughs> we, Walter, we have a good time on this show. Just be warm for sure, so, for sure, and go yeah. with the flow, please. <laughs> That's right. So, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. First of all, I mean, the excitement is really on my side because I'm really excited to meet you guys and to have the opportunity yeah, to talk to you in exchange on yeah, things like VUCA. And, you know, in, in the background, by the way, that's German. And it says, luckily, it's only VUCA. Oh, this nice. is my attitude. <laughs> yes, luckily, yeah. it's only VUCA. And I'm really looking forward to have a great exchange with you. And I'm, yeah, I'm really open to any question you want to ask me. And whenever I can contribute, I will gladly do. So thanks again, Mike, to you and also to Chris. And maybe, Chris, maybe you should take the stage huh? if you are uh, in the back background already. <laughs> I have been on the other side of the camera too long. <laughs> That's right. 25 years and interviewing people, and I'm just I'm just coming out of my shell now. That's right. He's, he's <laughs> discovering good. the new him. I mean, he is discovering his future self right here. So yeah. it's, it's very cool to see Vuka right in front of us. So and it's inspiring. I mean, it's inspiring. So let's get inspired even more. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so I want to dive into that. So before we reveal kind of this secret to successfully leading in this chaotic times, which I think a lot of people want to know about. Share with our audience who you are, a little bit about your background, and how you became one of Germany's really top change management experts and people that are, are familiar with VUCA. Uh, well, of course, I'm. Uh, first of all, well, I'm not sure if I'm on the top of the list. What I can tell actually is that I'm really found very often due to I'm dealing with VUCA and I'm doing it already for several years already. And the, the COVID-19 pandemic really was a very good news for me because the world is experiencing VUCA and they are looking for solutions and uh, yeah, how to, to navigate these VUCA waves. And then they find a way to my, to my, to me personally as well to what I'm doing actually around. And this to answer your question, I'm an organization developer and I'm already 59 years old so I look <laughs> I look back to a lot of life experience when I have been also a leader I was a leader of a profit center so I really had to check and take care for figures and uh, also for the people who were necessarily the ones who really created these figures and these successes success stories together with me and uh, already went, while I was a leader I had uh, the idea to become a coach because I like this attitude to make other people better and be of help to explore new ways and maybe to really develop the resources you have inside of yourself. And I have been part of um, a, sub a subsidiary board. And uh, so why I'm telling this because I have different perspectives. I have a perspective mm -hmm. from the inside of an organization even when I was an employee, not just a manager or leader, also an employee. And since the last 12 years, I have now the external uh, perspective while I'm really helping yeah, um, organizations and people within the organizations to deal with change, which for me is really um, yeah, maybe reconsidering the past but also much more um, getting into transformation, which is uh, more backcasting, uh, start with the end in mind, more looking from 
what do we want to really um yeah how do we can su succeed and what do we really want to achieve and this is these are the perspectives that i have and the last sentence to the wuka wuka world um, I'm dealing with this for about, I think it was 2015 that I found this term and that I had my first lecture about VUCA. Wow. wow. Well, um, the, the, I have two questions, okay? The first question will ping off of what you just said, which is that you're also looking at kind of a future back kind of concept as, as well as where we are right now, which is really important. Because what Mike and I did with the uh, with its VUCA, the movie, the secret to living in the 21st century, really what it is is it's there's these external forces of VUCA, right? And then there's internal for folks uh, forces as you talked about from the employees. So there's these these two worlds of VUCA. There's mm -hmm. the 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 V's of VUCA, which are the volatility, uncertainty, you know, uh, <clears throat> complexity and ambiguity. But how does that affect? us as people what does that do to us and that causes us to change things so that gets to my first question which is um how do we bring vuca down to a personal level because you deal with organizations but that also just gets down to individuals after a while mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so in other words one of the things that we did the documentary for <clears throat> was to wake people up wake people up to the vuca world to the future and to prepare mm -hmm. them for it Mm -hmm. Are they ready for it? Which we mm -hmm. say no, right? Most people are just saying, I hope they figure this out. But whoever <laughs> the day is, we don't know, right? Exactly. The government, yeah. the, the companies, the which is if in the documentary we call it, it, everybody has to be a hero, okay? So I want to have you comment to that idea, the internal stuff, the trauma, the hopelessness, the inability to cope, that you're familiar with Alvin Toffler, of course, the futurist, you know, future shock. That stuff is now on steroids. Okay. So that's one question. The individual. Mm -hmm. The next question is, as we talked about before we got on the show, why is VUCA or why has VUCA or the concept of VUCA really taken off in Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and especially India? So two questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I mean, first, um, um, yeah, thinking about the first question, some, some answers to the first question is, I mean, first of all, I think really every human being should be in contact with him or herself about the needs I have. And then be aware of how are my needs really fulfilled or what are the effects and affection I really have to deal with if I'm part of an environment. Yeah. So if I'm part of an environment, I, for example, might feel, oh, there is a volatility. There is an uncertainty. There is a, a complexity. There is ambiguity. And this um, affects me and how how much am I really open to really first realize there are effects which really, for example, stresses me and then try to understand what is it about? What, what, what stresses me, for example, or what puts me under pressure or what, what um, insecures me? So I think this would be really a first approach to be, I'm, I'm often talking about be authentic as much as you can be. And authentic means for me really being in contact with your emotions, with your needs, with your vision, for example, your, your values, what is really valuable to you, what is important to you, and then check it, okay, what do I want to have and uh, where do I have, uh, what, what is the environment or what is the context I'm living in and how much is there maybe a discrepancy, yeah? And if I really want to name it VUCA, well, that's one decision, but I think VUCA at least is just a term, it's just an acronym. Mm -hmm. So I'm always talking about the phenomena that show effect on my, my, my existence, for example, on, let's say, on my private role, on my family, on my, even if I have a personal role in, a, in, a, in an organization, yeah, and then really be aware about, yeah, what do I need to feel good, to feel healthy, to be in, um, to be responsive, to be able to take influence, to be able to take decisions. So th these are the questions I'm, I really want to offer to, to humans 
yeah to really take a time to stand for a moment and really kind of reflect maybe a bit or even yeah just just feel just take get awareness of what's going on and how mm -hmm. does it really bother me because for example if it doesn't bother me why should i care yeah so this is another thing about encouraging people no. to decide okay well the world is wuka and unfortunately and i'm really really sad about the, the war in um in ukraine ukraine yeah. still there are people that say okay actually it doesn't bother me and as long as it doesn't bother me why should i care and really mm -hmm. i don't want to judge this attitude but i think it's important to be prepared in case that it will affect me that it will have some impact on my life on me personally to be a bit more prepared and then be um yeah courageous enough to take decisions what to do and what to not to do so is this an, maybe an answer to your first question regarding the human being do you think that it do you think that there's a point that people get to where and, and where they they get so overwhelmed, you know, that they actually click off, they ignore it, or they push it aside, you know, which is a real problem in a VUCA environment where you you put it on the back burner, and then it gets worse and it gets worse and it works. We Mike and I call them plus ones and minus ones. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. plus ones are where you're going forward, and the minus ones are where you're going back into safety, mm -hmm. back. Into, back into pushing it off, pushing it off and pushing it off. But do you think that's happening now in the world? There's so much change so fast and so much uh, newness and then loss at the same time that people just go, I'm just going to take care of today. Yeah. Not worry about tomorrow. Indeed, being in the here and now, I mean, this is also a value, being in the here and now and just realizing, okay, does it bother me? Do I really have to get involved? Don't blame this decision. And I think that's the tricky thing about it, yeah? And not, not just to keep still and say, okay, it doesn't bother me and I don't have really, I have I have no, uh, it's, it's not my, my game, it's not my show. I, I don't want to say this and I really want to encourage people to find for example, a role or to find at least a, a, a purpose, why mm -hmm. to engage and how to engage. I think there should be maybe different levels, why to engage and how to engage and to have the right people for situations within situations that really can create solutions or at least a, a proper attitude, how to deal with this, what's happening around me, that it don't, that it will not bother you at all. I think this is very naive. Yeah, so because the things are not as trivial, trivial as they have been maybe years before. So, um, but I think um, it's also a, a question of resilience. How resilient are the people to accept, for example, first of all, okay, that's a VUCA world we are living in, just like you say, it's VUCA. And I mean, it's not a brand new term. We are talking about VUCA for more than 30 years uh, way back right. when yeah so yeah. and um, if we look at this I, I found that it's coming from even from some university professors uh, uh, lecturers who were talking to organizations already in the middle of uh, the 80s yeah so this has been a matter for companies and for people within the companies for for decades already yeah so at least they cannot ignore that something's going on but i think the question is how how well we are already experienced with things to deal with things what really has to be changed in attitude, behavior, in solutions? I think there is maybe a difference that standing still, awaiting for solutions to come, maybe not, not just, just being in a mode of reacting and or not acting, this might not be valid anymore, I think. Yeah, because yeah, I, we're talking about collaboration, co-creation. So it really takes a common effort to, to move things. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I want to piggyback off that because it I, I think that's really important. You say, um, and this goes to Chris's second question in some ways is Vuka, as Chris and I talk about, has been you know here from the beginning of time, right? I mean, it, you know, Earth was formed out of chaos. If if you go down that that pathway, exactly. So you, you look at it, and we go, we've been living in this Vuka environment as humans. We've been able to you know navigate because, as we say in the movie, you know, 30 steps back in the day was 30 steps. Now, 30 steps is like 
a billion steps, right? Things are moving so quickly, yeah. which is that fight, yeah. flight, or freeze yeah. standpoint. You say it's, it, you know, we've been talking about it since the 80s, true enough. But I remember when we were interviewing the guys at Future Strategy Group and, and they were saying, gosh, it's something that's known to less than 1% of the people in the entire world, right? Top companies and certainly us in the military who serve the military, yeah. think tanks, yeah. all that. Yeah. yeah. But to Chris's point, it, when you look at the studies, you know, y Europe, India, Australia, it, you guys seem to have VUCA as part of the vocabulary. And here, you know, in America, people are like, wow, that's such a clever term. That's amazing. Wow, you guys are so genius. And we're like, wow, Chris is genius. I didn't even know about it. And I served in the military. So so why do you think it is so prevalent in, in, in your Europe and India and all these other countries? Ah, that's an interesting point. So I, I indeed I haven't been aware that maybe you Americans are even more relaxed about VUCA than we maybe in Europe have been before. Yeah, maybe it's a really. I mean, thinking about that, um, there has a big, big stability in the U.S. Yeah, and I think this is really maybe one impact what we are facing in in, in European countries. Yeah, so um, the idea to really improve as one really big um, union, a European Union, as one community of countries who who, who really can can uh, enlarge the strength uh, within this getting together and having a common strategy, a common common attitude, having common concepts. Yeah, I think maybe this could be one uh, one reason why we really deal more with with all these items, like or with all these phenomena, like volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Because if you have more than 25, 27 states, nations, yeah, who want to join for one big purpose, yeah, this is the ambiguity at its it's pure ambiguity so maybe yeah. this could be a reason that we are uh, thinking or we are a bit more aware of how to deal with it and talking about like India of course we have a lot of emerging countries um, this is of course maybe another aspect so that what what has been common even from the culture of nation for example yeah uh, what has been common common for for Americans maybe this is different from India definitely yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And getting getting more opportunities, really being much more informed about what's going on in the world, having the access to Internet, for example, yeah, having much more possibilities, opportunities to develop yourself, to, to have more opportunities to shoot, to, to choose, to have much more opportunities to select, for example. Uh, this might be all effects why it's maybe a bit more more obvious or evident that we are talking about VUCA. But that's just a guess. Do you think the, 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 your clients, when you go to your clients, are they, do you have to educate them on VUCA or are they, are they pretty aware of it? Um, as well as, and this is typically for, for VUCA, we say it's not a, uh, either or, it's really the as well as a, approach. You uh -huh. know, we have, I, I have three categories of customers and maybe target groups as well. Um, there is one first group is they never heard of VUCA of this term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they really want to un understand, okay, what are these four letters and what's behind this? Ah, it's coming from the American War College. Uh, no, then it does. Maybe this is another aspect, by the way. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it's not in my context because that's a uh, military. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, but still they are fine because they want to understand, okay, this is a term we, we hear of, very often about it, especially since COVID-19. And then um, the second target group um, is the one who is really interested to understand, okay, that's VUCA and to realize the impacts the, on the organization, on the, on the, on the, on the teams, on okay. the individuals. So, and then there is a third group, they say, I don't know how to name it, but what you describe, what VUCA is, that's our daily business. Right, so yeah. they are already in a mode to, to navigate, to, they already have maybe found ways to deal with volatility, uncertainty, com complexity, and ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, it, it's, you know, when we shot the, the documentary, 
the, the world was upside down, right? I mean, Chris called me. It was it was it was uh, August or I, I think it was July of 2020, right? We had early stages, had no idea what was going on. Chris calls us, hey, we got to do it on this, you know, on VUCA. And I'm like, I, I don't even know what VUCA is, Chris. And he's like, you're the military guy. You should know what this is. And then that put us on this pattern of just collecting all these amazing thought mm-hmm. leaders like General Casey and Boinkin and, you know, futurists and Stephen Kotler and Michael Hyatt, you know, all these amazing people, right? Which we never could have done had the pandemic not happened, right? So it, that's, but that's the key of VUCA is even though VUCA could be chaotic, there's opportunity in that. And so my question goes to this, to this day, according to NCAP, um, you know, there's many organizations that have failed, right? Uh, across the world, businesses, organizations, companies, major shifts, some that have filed bankruptcy, some that have just flat out disappeared. What do you see, Walter, with your clients that separates those who succeed from those who don't? What mm-hmm. is it? Yeah, yeah. It's a very good question. And you know, this is a question I, I, I'm very often asked, especially by customers who say who come to me and say, okay, please help us because they want to find the secret. Yeah, they want to know yeah. the secret. What do other companies better than we do? Because we are ahead of a crisis. Yeah, we are having a lot of problems that other companies maybe don't have. Yeah. So, and I tell them, listen, there is not a best practice. Maybe it's the best thinking. You, we can think together and it could be a kind of sparring we can think about. But I think that a main difference is also a bit in, in relation and it refers to the differentiation between change management and transformation. I think there are a lot of companies who are really doing change management, really improving the past and trying to mm-hmm. stick to one concept, maybe to one strategy, even if it's not done, uh, written for the next five years, maybe they, they, they create a strategy for the next 24 months, which is uh, opportune. Still, they are not really putting the business model on its test, on a proof. They just say, okay, it, it all the time it was it, it was valid, it was stable. Okay, we have some ups and downs, but they say let's move on. And then there yeah. are other companies they anticipate a bit more the future, and they say, okay, for example, if we want to have the vision, what what would be missing in the world without us? How can we create maybe things that are really important and we are looking ahead? For example, we are also looking at some trends. I mean, you, you're talking about futurists. Yeah. So why not having futurists help you at least really? anticipate what could the world be like and what do we do we want to be like or what should be our purpose? How can we contribute? How can we um, yeah, have a share of this? Yeah. So I think this is a. Uh, question also of company culture for example what i regarding also in uh, in regard to your question what i notice is that if i'm talking to customers who have a very traditional way of leading management for example very hierarchical yeah top down yeah they very often have much more uh, many more problems than the company who was already maybe set as okay, let's understand it as a teamwork. Let's let's really strengthen self-organization. Let's let's really create a framework in a company where the people are willing to take responsibility, accountability. Yeah. So this is what I'm saying about more collaboration, cross-functional work, getting out of the silos, things like this. So these are at least two mainstreams that. I would say that the first stream is maybe not really prepared well for VUCA or dealing with VUCA, the others even a bit more. And still more and more we find some companies who do the, uh, you, you will know the, the, the term of ambidextry, you know ambidextry, mm-hmm. doing it with sure, both yeah. hands. Yeah. So it's one A, one A as an answer to the ambiguity. It's not just agility and adaptability. Uh, putting it much more specific adaptability could mean having both having the traditional maybe part of a company of an organization which is still successful and which still needs those people who like to be led hier- hierarchically and maybe at the same time having a kind of part of maybe like a lab yeah uh, being innovative being more being quicker for example being not being more uh, responsive to to this instability 
Yeah. Mm. So this is also what we already discover in Germany that we have more and more companies, especially big companies who allow themselves and who are able to pay for it. I mean, they really can afford this. Yeah. To really um, serving two streams because they know mm. they really have to be pre prepared for the future, but still they have to, yeah, uh, yeah, to, to do, deal with the presence. Well, there's a short termism in all companies. In my, my background, of course, I've dealt with my two biggest clients are Google and Disney. So, you know, and they're both very progressive companies, but but still they have a real problem with they're, they're incentivized for the next for the next six months or the next three months. And they're all thinking about their retirement and their pension plans. And they're going, yeah. you know, yeah. they're going, VUCA, yeah, sure, right. You know, I'll deal with that. Uh, after let them deal with that again that's one of those days things yeah. uh one of the things that's interesting about companies i'm just going to ask you this question is <clears throat> companies I, I i don't think individuals do know a lot of this stuff but i think companies really they do hire futurists and they do hire insight people you know we use one of the analogies since you're from germany that uh, for people but i think it's also for companies it's like you were driving along in the freeway, right? And it was 60 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden, somebody came in and changed the speed to unlimited, right? All of a sudden, you're driving on the Autobahn, right? Mm -hmm. And like companies go, oh, we are? Yeah, the future is moving faster than you think, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but that's that short terminism again, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, one of the things that's cool about VUCA is it does, it has, it adds an urgency to things, right? It says that we're in a VUCA world, things are speeding up, you know, you should get involved. My question is, is kind of another al analogy we use is maybe this could be the three mistakes that people make in this area, in companies or people. We call it, uh, I don't know, do you ever remember the movie Spinal Tap? Uh, it was no. Spinal Tap was a, it was a documentary, a uh, mockumentary about a, a band about a heavy metal band. They went in and they talked to the- uh, It's the so great, guitars. it really was. Lead guitarist, yeah. I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Yeah. The lead guitarist and they said, he said, uh, why do all your amps go to 11, right? The, the volume only goes to 10. He says, no, 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 these go to 11, right? In other words, the VUCA world's kind of like that. And it's what we talk about in the documentary. What, what I'm gonna ask you is, do companies understand things like that what we're dealing with here is kind of a hyper world. It's not resilience, it's anti-fragile resilience. It's not small ideas, it's big, hairy, audacious goals. Mm -hmm. It's not, well, let's do some innovation. No, 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 it's heightened creativity, it's heightened innovation. So along those lines, that idea of going to 11, what are the three biggest mistakes that companies make mm -hmm. to it's not good. do that? Well, I think the first point is really no pain, no gain. Uh, yeah, That's no pain, great. no gain. I think That's this is great. this is very, very important. I mean, when do people move? When do really? When do you? Wh when what? What has to happen, Chris, that you really get into action? That you're really burning for 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 a target. You know, well, you're either truly inspired or you're moving out of pain or fear, right? I mean, I think exactly. you're rock sure. bottom. Yeah. It's the rock bottom area. Oh, we've yeah. hit rock bottom. Yeah, we've got to bring exactly. in a new CEO, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think you're talking about the three mistakes. I mean, first of all, really, uh, the first mistake could be that you are only willing to move to get into action by pain. Why not mm -hmm. being? Why not doing it by love? Because you love, for example, to be ahead of 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 um, of innovation or really contributing to the world. Let's say in regard to sustainability. Yeah. Why? 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 I mean, this is not a thing. I think this is also um, maybe uh, I'm thinking about the question. I don't have really proper answers. I'm not prepared answers. I'm just reflecting about it. But um, how do I have a real consciousness about the role? I want to play in the world or I want to play in the context. Good. Yeah. So if I'm really the type like me, for example, I just tell a short story. Two years ago, I'm really happy about COVID-19, the pandemic, because otherwise we wouldn't meet. I, we're never, to go, uh, go, never going to get to know you guys. So 
it was an American who called me two years ago. We had a Zoom exchange and he said, listen, uh, what is about this VUCA methodology? What I asked and I said, sorry, there is no VUCA methodology. There are ways how to deal with it. But I thought, okay, that's an interesting idea, having a VUCA methodology. Yeah, let's think about it. So I got creative and I thought, okay, this would really be a big inspiration for me because my customers, they all quit because I was not able to go there. I had to do it here digitally. So how could I take my time, use my time and be creative? So I created this VUCA facilitation course. Yeah, and I have a trademark in Germany for the VUCA facilitator. And I thought this could be a very good business model for me to earn money, for example. And again, of course, it was a pain point because if I'm losing my traditional business, I have to take care for my expenses. So where to come, where the money comes from, maybe finding a new product and getting it into the world. Yeah. But mm -hmm. also people, they sometimes uh, companies, sometimes they are not hungry anymore. They are really, they are set and also they have maybe employees who say, okay, listen, especially in Germany, I have another five years till I retire. So let's slow down. And really, I don't blame them because they have done a hard job most likely for all the years. Yeah. So there's no pain, no gain is having not a real clear vision maybe about yeah. what, what yeah. could our, what, what, what could be very interesting to go for, to be, to head for. Yeah. And the third thing might be that simply um yeah not being aware being insecure of how to do it mm. sometimes mm. really they are looking for solutions and maybe they are willing and some I, I'm, I, I'm i'm doing organizational development with, with companies who are willing to change to be more adaptive to vuca phenomena Still, they are struggling hard to be really adaptive, to be successful with a new concept, because this is really a change of company culture, for example. And com company culture is nothing that you really can switch on or off. Yeah, so this is another process and it takes another attitude. It takes, for example, taking off the incentives for, for a special group of people in the company. Yeah, and not giving it, for example, as a team incentive. Yeah, really mm -hmm. having new uh, paradigms. Also, I think you really would have to change the paradigms in, 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 in companies. Yeah. So as I said, when I was in a company, um, I said, OK, I can only be as success, successful as my team is. So and this was a quite a different attitude. Yeah. And I did a lot of leadership. Yeah. And I was willing and I had I enjoyed it to do leadership. Still, I came to a point where I said, oh, I'm fed off and I don't want to be a part of this organization anymore. I don't want to be a leader anymore. Yeah? I want to get rid of all this uh, um, accountability and responsibility. Yeah? So it's also a thing of um, what you like and maybe where you really can be shiny, where you really can be successful and really contribute to, to, to a change in the world. I, I love that. that. But that was a great response. Yeah. Was yeah that was, that was, Thank you. It was terrific. Yeah. Yeah, that Why? was really good. Wait, I, I let, love... me, let me let me let me hear your thoughts about it. About uh, about what people need to change, how they should. No, what you what you just liked. What 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 what, what well, is what great? I liked about? Well, I'll let Mike. Uh, I'll let me just quickly say. Um, I think one of the things that um, that you said was, um, you know, you keep bringing up this word attitude, right? Mm -hmm. It's an attitude shift, which is a big part of what we think, and we do have some methodology too. We would think we should talk more about this. We have a thing called the VUCA line, above and below the VUCA line. We have a thing called the VUCA state of mind, which are methodologies, because you're absolutely right. There is no methodology. And one of the biggest things is 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 attitude, how I think, how I feel, and how I mm -hmm. act. You really have to go into those atomic, that atomic level and change that shared consciousness mm -hmm. that that uh that that team stuff that we're talking about mm -hmm. teams of teams and that we might be call it shape shifting or actually bob mm -hmm. johansson does where you you change it leadership from the from behind yeah right um and when you were talking about all of that that's what you were alluding to all of that kind of stuff teams and attitudes and that kind of shift and i love that whole idea of a book facilitator i think that's mm -hmm. terrific i'd love to know more about that but that's what I got, you know, okay. yeah. it kind of went down to more of a, a more of a micro level, which I which which Mike 
likes very much. Yeah, I do. I, I do. I, so it, it's so interesting because there's a couple pieces that I was taking out. Like I, I immediately went to shape shifting organizations, Bob Johansson's term. Yeah. Or, you know, you got hierarchy and the combination of two, right? You know, maybe some, there's a hierarchical platform that people uh, operate under, but there's a shape-shifting part of the team too that allows them to be progressive and innovative right. and think outside the box. I think that's really important. You also alluded to, you know, people are trying to fix the past mm. to deal with the future, which led me to, wait a second, yes, we talk about this, which is you can't fix 21st century problems with 20th century thinking, which is what many companies are doing today and even individuals. Or, 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 or feudal, feudal thinking. So, feudal thinking, <laughs> right. Yeah. Which, but hit the pain, no pain, no gain. So in the military, we talked about that often, right? In the military, we always train for the unexpected. And Chris and I talk about this often is in the military, the culture is about training for things that may or may not happen. Two types of plans, plans that might work and plans that don't work, right? So we're kind of geared for that thinking already. So when we embrace chaos, well, we train for chaos. Yeah. We might not have trained for that specific chaos, but at least we have a framework for how to deal with it. I think the important part that I love about what you're saying is you have to understand that no pain, no gain is part of life, number one. Right? That is life, no matter what, where it's spiritual, yeah. mental, physical, emotional, economical, whatever, there's gonna be pain in those areas. But if you're not willing to break through that pain, you're not going to discover your best self. That's what I took from that. And so if individuals and organizations can it, it can truly embrace that, like, yeah. where are we? Where are our pain points? Like, mm. why do organizations not just look at their teams and go, yeah, it's good. OK, yeah, but good is not great. Right. So where's our pain points? Yeah. This is a painful moment. Yeah. And that requires that requires true assessment. And, and I'm with Chris. I love that facilitator model. I love oh, and thank we you. call them VUCA warriors. You know, we that's what we call them. But that's yeah, VUCA you know. warrior way and all that. We yeah. we have something. The thing that's interesting about VUCA for our methodology and some of this going to 12 stuff or going to 11 stuff is that VUCA is counterintuitive because uh anti-fragile resilience, we have an anti-fragile tool which shows you that the there's actually a pain a pain uh gain threshold the more you're into fragility mm -hmm. the more pain you're going to have the more you're into anti-fragility the less pain you're going to have because you're going that's that hero's journey that story you're going through your pains you're coming mm -hmm. out them you're mm -hmm. seeing gains because you're achieving things and that's what life is about it is about facing the pain to see the light on the other side, yeah. right? And you don't see that the more you get into anti-fragility, the more you get into going back into the comfort zone, the more, actually, the more pain that you yeah. you have. Uh, another thing that's along the same line to this counterintuitive is discipline is freedom. Mm -hmm. Discipline is less pain. The more things you take, you the more of the VUCA world that's confusing the news media, do having bad habits, all this micro stuff, the more that you discipline yourself, you actually find more solace and more serenity because you're getting rid of the wrong stuff. Exactly. So that's right. It's that it's understanding pain. Yeah. Which I thought was brilliant. Yeah. Yes. And um, I mean, I have uh, it's an inspiration. First of all, Mike, I'm, um, I'm not thinking out of the box. I'm thinking with no box. There you go. Yay. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I, and I think that's brilliant, yes, right? That's really most right. people, that's right. especially right. men, we want to compartmentalize. Like, <laughs> give me my box. Let me have it in my box. There is no more box. There and no you more box. women, to their credit, are like, uh, and I don't remember who coined this, but like the internet super highway, your brains work in areas where there's no, there's no limitations, right? But guys are like, okay, I'm going to compartmentalize. <laughs> This equals this. I, I, you're right. There is no box. And, and you speak to that. And I want to leverage off of what Chris said, because you said something so important, which is changing mindset, right? Changing mindset and culture, right? So you deal with this, you know, getting companies to be agile, right? That's, that, that's one of the things. You, you Listen, 
you're, you're feeling the pain. You need to do something different. The old ways are not going to work. So you need to be agile. You got to be open. You got to be a growth mindset. So your mindset. So what are the key steps to helping the individuals inside of companies change mindset, which is not easy because we're talking about neuro, you know, neuroscience and all that stuff at that point, right? It's one thing to say, Chris, you need to do 100 push-ups. And Chris's like, yeah, I'll do it. Which would be this, a discipline thing again, yeah. Right. Um, I think it would be great as if you could do it the way you did before because it really somehow maybe you you, you you later. What are like five things people can do? Yeah. To Mike's, to Mike's question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, you, you mentioned some some uh, key words that are really part of my facilitation program, like a gross mindset by Carol Dweck. Yeah. And her, her famous word is not yet. Yeah. Not yet. I mean, this has such a power. I'm really shivering about not yet. This means that the sky is the limit. We, we yeah. people, we are so well equipped. And this, by the way, this is another problem. Why not really being a bit more prepared for, for WUCA? Because the companies only look at the skills of a person. They don't look at the resources of a person and they, and they don't look at the so person at good. its in, in its whole, because, for example, as uh, very often I, I, I meet maybe a, a manager uh, on a Saturday with his family and I think, oh, what is this, Mr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? So this is a real different personality, but it's all in one. So so many uh, parts of, of this personality that could be really used, that could be really a prerequisite to deal with change and to, to really guide transformation. This is not used by companies. And by the way, that's what I really teach to leaders. I say, please look at what's already there and maybe just reuse it, redefine it and make it make it sensible for a certain purpose. And then you might be already so well equipped instead of searching for something, asking and giving a problem to the team, for example, to solve it together. Yeah, because then maybe, and I think this is what you are doing in the army. You are well prepared. And this is the thing, you, you, you cannot plan anymore. At least you need to have a plan B. But this being well prepared for it, yeah, if you are asking for five things, yeah, being prepared instead of stuck into plans, for example, really thinking with no box, yeah. And mm -hmm. so if, if I, if I, if, if I'm allowed to be crazy, you know, I'm a creative person and I really don't want to have some limitations. And you said agile, agile. I'm adaptive. I'm agile because what is agility? And agility, for example, is very often stuck to scrum framework, Kanban, design thinking. So we are again talking about tools and methods, but we are not talking about an attitude. So being adaptive, what does it need? And this Chris, is another answer to you. One of the five things is really being adaptive, but still not knowing what is right and what is wrong, being really open, being curious, being really courageous to try to fail. Yeah, and to learn, mm -hmm. having a learning culture, by the way, yeah. For yeah. example, being open, yeah, being the child uh, that you were maybe at the age of five. So what's crazy about that or bad about that, yeah. And also being, um, uh, one thing is to re, no, to unlearn, to unlearn, not only learn new things, uh, but also yes. to unlearn, to get yeah. rid of old habits, or at least put them to a proof. Is it still valid? Is it still um, creating value? Is it still helpful? Yeah. And maybe a fifth thing is um, having the idea of, of a, a butterfly. Do you know the idea? I like very much the idea of a butterfly. You know, to have a butterfly, you need to have a caterpillar. So two systems, that's a bit more like the ambidextry, being really open that it takes a caterpillar to really get a wonderful butterfly means really being open to leave things, to cut things, to really bury things, yeah, really to put them to grave <laughs> because yeah. a caterpillar will not survive. So not being too much stuck into um, stuck with the with the past and not being open to maybe let go. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to say because, for example, I have a lot of clothes and I'm so heavy to let go of these clothes. Yeah. And I think how stupid is this? But it's a lot of it's a burden. I'm really keeping burden. And so being maybe really um, decided to, yeah, to to release yourself and to find a kind of relief, whatever it might be. Yeah, that is that so good. Great. Chris, I'm glad you went to the five points because you, you said something uh, and Chris and I have talked about this. So I went through this whole unlearning exercise. 
I, it, Chris had to suffer through this as I went through this, right? It, it, it took about four months. And, and he hasn't learned very much either. So yeah, and I haven't learned very much. So when you unlearn what you don't know, it's crazy. But it the it's interesting to me because that term unlearning, because as a culture, and I don't know if this is true in Europe or not, but certainly here in the United States, is we're always talking about, oh, I got to learn more. Oh, what's the next thing? I got to learn more. I got to learn more, right? I got to keep compounding on the information I have. What new course can I take? What more new thing can I learn? It's for those who are growth mindset, right? What's always unlearning, but part of a growth mindset, and I want you to unpack this a little bit on this unlearning, share with us like the major point and importance of unlearning something, because it's very, very powerful, but I want to hear it from your perspective. Why should somebody unlearn something? <laughs> uh, um, I mean, first of all, I mean, you could ask the, the question the other way around. Why do we have constantly to learn? So I think there is a, there is um, maybe this is like a, like how do you say in English when it's like a substitute, a synonym, a synonym for um, developing is learning. Yeah, so maybe this is a synonym. If you really wanna wanna grow, you need to learn. So maybe this is the wrong um, the wrong um, paradigm, or what is the the mm -hmm. wrong uh, pre? I, I'm missing the English word. Excuse me, I'm just uh, catching uh, scratching Chris, for the word. Chris isn't very good with English either, so don't worry. Well, about paradigm, it. Paradigm's <laughs> a great yeah. word. Paradigm's <laughs> a great word. I'll just it, 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 I don't want to cut off the thought here, but because. Paradigm is actually part of the unlearning. When you you have a paradigm in life, especially your past, that's what you've learned. And sometimes to go forward into the future, right? If you're still on that old paradigm, you need to unlearn that old paradigm. Otherwise, you're always living in the past. Are you living yeah. in past habits, or past models? I don't know if that's where you were going with that, but mm -hmm. that's a big part of unlearning, especially in psychology. It's yeah, unlearning things that are not helping you. You're, you've got a monkey mind, you know? What's interesting about the unlearning though is people think, oh, I'm losing something, but unlearning really is growth. It's the way to go forward. You cannot Correct. go forward yeah. unless you unlearn some of those old paradigms, which I think those you're right, paradigms. it is a good word. Yeah. 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 And still, I mean, for example, the companies, they're having a big, really HR offering, like um, a learning and development de a company a department, for example. Yeah. But for example, what they never do is they what they do is they send their people to courses, yeah, to seminars and whatever. They never or rarely, only rarely really look on return on a return of development investment, the roadie return on the, uh, of uh, um, development in, uh, investment. So they never look, they just, I mean, what was the purpose? What was it good for? What would have missed the company if they didn't send the people to, to all these courses, to all these learning sessions and so on. So the purpose behind it, what should be different after you have, uh, for example, attended such a course. That's not really the question. So, and, and this, for example, is a thing in Germany. In Germany, you, you may really ask for learning and development courses for, for a budget, for example, and they give it to you because we have uh, the, 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 the workers' councils, for example, they really take care that people are well educated, that they really learn and learn and learn to be, because and I think this is another synonym. Learning is about being prepared. Yeah. Mm. And I think yeah. in the VUCA world, maybe unlearning is a better preparation for really being VUCA fit, for being a yeah. bit more uh, yeah, VUCA, VUCA um, adaptive, adaptive, maybe. Yeah. So, and um, this is one thing about the unlearning. And um, I think you really have to dare to say, sorry, I'm not willing to learn anymore because I'm well equipped and I just want to change the perspective. And that's, by the way, what we do in the WUCA facilitator course. We tell the people, listen, you might not really learn one new thing you, because there are coaches, there are consultants who are attending. And I said, it might happen that you think you will not have learned one new thing, not, not one new method. But what I can guarantee is that this one method that is already familiar to you, you will definitely reuse it within this VUCA context. 
So a good news is you are already well equipped. But for example, if you only have a hammer, yeah, then every problem is a kneel. This, this is a quote by uh, Paul Watzler. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we will tell them, listen, we look in your toolbox what's already existing. Yeah, and then we find out together. Okay, don't look for a new tool, but maybe just reconsider the situation, understand much more the context, and maybe you find out that you're so well equipped and then you simply do it the other way around where you haven't th thought of because we say don't do it, it's not the way you have to do it, and be courageous, be decided just to try. And then maybe mm -hmm. they find out, yeah, okay, I don't have to learn new things, maybe I have to learn a better dealing, a better handling of things which are already existing. And this would, of course, also take a bit out of the dynamic, I think, and out of the, a bit of the complexity also. Maybe it would really reduce, you cannot reduce complexity, but it would reduce the stress you feel with dealing com with complexity. Yeah. Yeah, I've got one question on HR. That's, I think, what we're heading into that area, which has to do with focus. So, you know, so many people now are, not going back to the office, right? They are living all over the country. They can live anywhere they want to do. They they are they can they can and anywhere they want they can have a job uh, and work with the main office. Do you think? And this could be positive or negative. I don't know which way it goes, because VUCA is really driven back in the obviously the Army War College days. Technology is what drives VUCA. Okay, what turned all the wars into wars of people that had, uh, you know, uh, access to cell phones and satellites and then why big comp big big armies had a hard time uh, fighting them because it, it kind of leveled the playing field. But in this context, what I'm talking about is we're talking about uncertainty, talking about complexity, and we're talking about ambiguity. People in HR and people in offices deal on a very facial recognition, you're in the room, I don't have to keep staring at you in a screen, which is fatiguing, you know, people now are zooming somebody across the hall, right? We've got new behaviors. Do you think this adds to the complexity of understanding a team, people, you know, getting to know somebody, or do you think the technology makes people more connected? More, there's more interpersonal, there's more interconnectivity. Where, where, where do you see it, or where have you, if you've dealt with HR? You know, and I agree with you, you can't just throw development at it and say, well, that's going to solve it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it helps, it helps the great attrition because people think, well, at least they care, they mm -hmm. gave me this course in whatever. So, what do you think? Do you think it's helping? making it more severe or do you think it's improving or mm -hmm. give, give me your thoughts yeah it's definitely helping but i mean uh, in germany we say um the do the dose makes the poison so um it depends like a knife i mean a knife with a knife you can cut flowers but you also can kill a man yeah right, so exactly. this is this is this is um <laughs> a, a digitalization or digitization and all the technolo technologies they, for me, they are very helpful. Still, I was one of those. Maybe it's because I'm, 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 a, I'm a baby, baby boomer. I really refrain to, I'm not really uh, keen on latest technology, technolo technological standard. I was using my Nokia uh, mobile phone really till it, it was not able to work anymore. So then I switched to, to an Apple uh, iPhone. Yeah. So I'm not an early adopter. Because I found no 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 value really in it to be on top of the latest uh, digital memes mm -hmm. devices or whatever. So and I'm not really interested in. So this is another point. If I'm interested in technology, I really welcome. I embrace technology uh, technological means. I think. And um, but now getting back to the point, I mean, there is a lot of prejudices that, for example, if we don't, we are not able to meet in person, we will miss a lot. Yeah. I will not really obey, uh, or, um, uh, is it obey the word? I, I'm not against this saying, yeah. Still, I mean, 
technology or having just the possibility the opportunities and the possibilities within technology might still not uh, decrease your level of creativity because maybe exactly because we are not able to meet in person and we are missing things which we could have if met in person then let's think about let's be creative let's be even co-operative uh, co yeah, uh, getting mm -hmm. into a kind of competition and uh, finding a good solution for what is valuable for us. What 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 do we want? What do want do we want to achieve? What are we uh, uh, missing? How can we get it? Yeah, things like that. So I think for me the inter interconnectivity, like you just mentioned, yeah, it's great because this is one answer to, for example, the complexity within the VUCA term, yeah, getting into getting into interaction, getting maybe into networks, like if you want to be agile, yeah, you, you really need to um, keep, keep much more in, in your mind, okay, what are the networks I need, yeah, where can I really connect to, so, and this is w wonderfully um, possible by, by digitization and all these digital means, still, I know what we are talking about when I said, for example, within the next two weeks, I will be in Berlin, our capital city, city and will be um, in a team of facilitators with 170 people, yeah, attendants from a big company. And I'm really looking forward to meet my colleagues because I'm sure that we can have a very good time and um, yeah, other experiences while not uh, while only doing it by by here by Zoom or by whatever technical wow. means. Yeah, see, I think I, that is I so it. good. This has been so informative. So yeah, it, it's so wonderful. I, I just want to say, Ms. Glazer, thank you for being on It's VUCA. I know that we have so much more to explore. We've got so much more to, I mean, we'll be in touch for sure. And for those that want to learn more about you, uh, VUCA-world.org is your website. Uh, for people to check that out. And certainly for those uh, here in the United States, certainly nationally, uh, uh, internationally as well, it's VUCA.com where they can see the yeah. film, they can see other things right there. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> so yeah, Miss Glazier, thank you. And I know thank that so uh, we'll be in okay. touch soon yeah. again. Thank you very much. It was really a great pleasure for me and I really enjoyed the time and I'm wondering 60 minutes already passed. So uh, it was a great time with you. Thank you guys and all the best for this very good project and really it's VUCA and let's really navigate the VUCA waves of the 21st century and even the 22nd century as well. Awesome. So I love it. Will, it will stay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye, -bye, Bye now. Bye-bye.